This is Twit. The technological boogeyman of the modern age appears to be deep fakes. On one hand, it's intriguing and powerful technology that's becoming rapidly democratized. On the other hand, the implications for the health of democracy itself, among other potentially damaging applications, can lead one down a path of fear and doubt, particularly as it improves uh, with every passing day. This stuff's getting really good. The focus as of late has shifted towards accepting their place in modern technology, along with uh, effective detection of deep deep fakes in order to limit the damage that could be inflicted by their negative applications. And joining us to talk about the systems that are being put into place to detect these deep fakes is Britt Paris, co-author of the new Data Society report titled Deep Fakes and Cheap Fakes. Welcome, Britt. Hi, thanks for having me. We're uh, It's a pleasure to get you on. Thank you so much for carving out some time to talk with us today. So uh, personally, like I'm, I'm fascinated by deep fakes. Mm -hmm. Anytime there's a new deep fake story making the rounds, like I'm, I'm equally like interested and, and fascinated, but also kind of slightly mortified of, of what could happen here. I'm aware of deep fakes. Your report is the first time that I personally heard the term cheap fakes. So can you start by maybe sharing some of the major differences between the two? Sure. So the report really looks at uh, a broad range of audiovisual manipulation or what we call audiovisual manipulation. So the deep fakes that we're all familiar with um, are artificial intelligence reliant techniques um, to graft faces, primarily faces onto existing videos. Um, but, you know, it can also include voices or grafting faces onto already extant bodies and videos. Um, those are the deep fakes that we are aware of. Um, but cheap fakes, the term that we coin or use to talk about uh, or cheap fix is what we uh, use to talk about more conventional methods of audiovisual manipulation, um, like speeding up or slowing down footage, staging footage, or you know having someone stand in for another person uh, to recontextualize that footage. Um, mm. So these cheap fakes are the more accessible forms of audiovisual manipulation, and they're not you know technically sophisticated, but they work to play with context. And like I say, they use lookalikes, stand-ins, relabeling footage of one event or one person as another. Um, and through doing this, media creators, um, you know, if we want to put it very uh, loosely, can easily manipulate an audience's interpretation of these videos. Absolutely. We're seeing this more and more. We're seeing it kind of in, in some many ways baked into, you know, just everyday, like so even social media products are starting to kind of head in these directions and do really kind of uh, interesting manipulative uh, visual effects like this. Now, you say that fakes and media are nothing new, which makes a lot of sense. But talk, talk a little bit about the historical perspective here. Um, is now any different than the past? It really feels very potent right now. But is that any different? In some ways it is, but in some ways, and it's it's an extension of, you know, old struggles over uh, power over evidence. So we talk about um, in the 1850s, whenever uh, photography was invented and people were starting to think about using photographic evidence in court and courts and judges mistrusted this technology because they didn't understand it mm -hmm. and they preferred um to have someone stand in on a case-by-case -case basis to explain the technology and what they were seeing and what's being captured in the technology, um, you know, really uh, relied on these expert interpretations of these videos, which were obviously, you know, often flawed. Um, and then, you know, we fast forward to the 1990s where broadcast media is complicit in recontextualizing or miscontextualizing or, uh, you know, uh, sort of um, playing with evidence um, in a number of different ways. The example that we use is uh, the Gulf War and coverage around the, the 1991 Gulf War, where uh, broadcast media constructed this conflict that seemed like it was a conflict between evenly matched adversaries, um, but, you know, indeed it wasn't. But these were real images, but what was manipulative about them um, was that, the, you know, how they were contextualized, interpreted, and broadcast around the clock on table television to uphold the political decisions of, you know, the government, the status quo. Um, so that's sort of a quick overview of the history that we go over. There are a lot of other specific examples, but... Um, 
You know, today we are able to manipulate videos and images using machine learning. Um, and these uh, results are now most almost impossible to detect by the human eye. Um, and now, you know, anyone with a public media, public social media profile is fair game to be faked. And once these fakes exist um, online, they can go viral on social media in a matter of seconds, and they're really hard to take down uh, if it's if that's you know something that's necessary. Hmm. So spe speaking to that virality, I mean, is do, do you sort of consider this part of of the the whole idea of a deep fake? Because a deep fake on its own that that doesn't sort of uh, have legs then just sort of disappears into the masses. So it's kind of like a, a positive and negative of the internet here. Um, so when you talk about deep fakes, are you primarily talking about ones tied to the virality of being shared a, across the, the landscape? Those seem to be the ones that have more power, obviously. Um, and is that kind of where the focus is on, on deep fakes, is, is getting uh, a manipulated video out there and then making sure that it goes out to, to, to the audience? Or is it more of like a, uh, a focused, uh, less, less about the, the virality, but more about just like, oh, I want to create this video and I want to you know, share it as evidence in like a court, for example, versus social. So kind of, I know that that question is a little confusing, but do we do we see it more as a method to share with the masses, or are these deepfakes kind of being used in smaller contexts more often? Yeah, so this is a really good question. Um, and in the report, we talk about um, how faked images, you know, deepfakes included, um, are interpreted as evidence or sort of interpreted as expression in different scenarios. And the real problematic scenarios are when faked images are interpreted as evidence and you know reach wide audiences at the speed and scale of social media, uh, you know, to the point that you know it's really hard to to not talk about them, right? Um, because they must be addressed. Um, in terms of, you know, I guess what we've seen thus far, a lot of the times the deep fakes, these um, videos, these faked videos made with machine learning techniques that we've seen being spread and uh, talked about in the media are ones that are primarily expressive. Um, but there are more and more examples um, of these videos that exist on pornography sites um, and to, to lesser degrees over social media, but they still do exist. Um, and these are videos, you know, they can be of uh, public figures, but sometimes they aren't. Yeah. Now, um, obviously, you know, machine learning, artificial intelligence systems, these are all being used to great effect to create these things. Now we're seeing these systems being created to detect them. How effective are they? How much should humans be involved in this process? I know there's a lot of work right now around AI being able to detect, you know, the subtleties of a deep fake and be able to determine that this is in fact a fake. And this is a, a big push. It's kind of part of the, the warfare against the, the potential damage of these things. But are we headed in the right direction as far as those systems are concerned, in your opinion? Right. And so this is one of the big things that we talk about also in the report. Um, you know, most of these uh, AI detection mechanisms uh, work to detect deep fakes at the point of capture. So whether or not something, you know, has been deep faked, um, it doesn't, they don't really address how things are disseminated or used as evidence. And indeed, you know, there's no artificial intelligence uh, mechanism that I've seen thus far that can determine how people will interpret some faked images as evidence and others as protected free expression. And this is sort of the issue uh, that this report gets at. Um, you know, while technical fixes, um, you know, determining pixels and, uh, you know, whether or not something's been faked or where it comes from is useful, but it doesn't go that far in terms of, um, you know, stopping the spread of harmful images necessarily. 
Right, right. Now, uh, another you know term that's that's coming up a lot in a, in a whole variety of facets in the world of technology is regulation. Everything appears to be in the target of regulation right now, or at least people th- seem to think that that's the solution for a lot of control over parts of technology that maybe they're afraid of or that are just growing so rapidly that they don't know what else you know would be effective. What do you think? Do you think uh, deep fake technology should be regulated? And if so, what? What should or would that law look like in order to be at all effective at this point? Um, so this may not be an incredibly popular opinion, uh, mm. but I think deep fake technology is something that should be regulated only in tandem with uh, the regulation of larger platform companies uh, that have, you know, gained a lot of economic um power by making it so that, you know, viral novel videos um, are rewarded uh, by achieving massive speeds and scales. Um, And I think that any sort of meaningful regulation would have to hold these different tech companies accountable uh, for the way that they uh, do incentivize maybe, you know, bad faith sharing of content. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people that would probably share uh, your opinion as far as that's concerned. We're seeing a lot sure. of the, the damage that, that can be done uh, through just the sheer network effect. And these things in collaboration with each other, man, it just really seems like it's a it's a it's a messy soup. Um Britt, I really appreciate you taking time. I know that you have to go. Datasociety.net is where people can go to find your report. Again, the title of the report, the report is Deep Fakes and Cheap Fakes. Everybody should definitely take a look at it. If you're at all interested in this emerging technology, it's definitely a great report to, uh, to read through. Britt, where do you want people to find you online if they want to follow the work that you're doing? Um, sure. They could follow me on Twitter at at D-R-B-R-I-T-T-P-A-R-I-S, Dr. Britt Paris. Awesome. Britt, thank you for taking the time. We really appreciate it and best of luck. Thank you. We'll talk to Take you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm. Bye-bye.